Okay. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the first uh, DOCO Practice Insights webinar that will focus on funding to financing. I am Peter Sereni, Communications and Knowledge Management Specialist at DOCO. And let me introduce our participants. I'm joined by Yannick Lemarek, Deputy Executive Director of UN Women, who will be speaking in his capacity as co-chair of the program working group. Uh, I'm also joined by Connie Wignaraja, Director of DOCO, and by Richard Bailey, Joint Funding, Financing for Development Specialist, uh, as well as uh, a good group of, of other colleagues uh, from DOCO and the MPTF, the Multi Partner Partnership Trust Fund Office. Um, this webinar is being done uh, in partnership with the UN System Staff College, who is on, which is online, and we will hear from them toward the end of the webinar. Uh, we have about 210 registered for this webinar today, so it looks like we have a great turnout, and we're looking forward to a lively conversation with you. Um, let me just tell you how the webinar will work. I will hand now to Connie, who will provide an overview of the Practice Insights webinar series. Uh, she will then hand to Yannick, who will introduce uh, funding to financing and why it's important and how we do it. Uh, this will take about 30 minutes, and then we will open the floor to your questions as well as to a few audience uh, polls. Um, please, at any time, put your questions in the question box. Uh, and I should also just remind everyone that this webinar is being recorded and will be shared um, via the Coordination Practice Network as well as on the website of the UN System Staff College and uh, UN DOCO. So without further ado, let me please hand over to Connie who will take us forward. Thank you, Peter, and, and greetings, everyone. Um, I want to to uh, provide a uh, scan, if you wish, of this uh, series that uh, we will be uh, running over the next uh, few weeks. And thank you very much for joining us as uh, we feel this is such a critical uh, point, a turning point in the way we think about how to use um, one of the UN's uh, most valued uh, capacities and, and convening points, which is around bringing a larger uh, amount of resources to the table than that which flows directly through us. So if you look at a fact which is that we are entrusted as a whole UN system with approximately 48 billion dollars per year um, through a variety of sources and means, that's about, about 0 0.5 um, um, 0 0.05 percent of the world's economy. Um, so it is large in our world, but it is a, a drop in what, what's really required uh, in order to help a ambitious agenda uh, like the SDGs, and if uh, all countries are to deliver on these uh, on these goals. So what we have focused on is is now to look at how best we can leverage these resources to really make the maximum possible impact. Uh, by also drawing in a whole lot more. And uh, for all of you, no matter where you're seated, I think this is a critical issue at this very juncture from a geopolitical point of view, um, not only for an economic and financial point of view, but also where the, the world is, is headed right now and the use of these critical resources to get in much more um, is at the heart uh, of the matter. So let's take a very quick uh, map of, of where we're headed with you on this webinar. So today we will uh, provide a, a um, I would say, a political economy, if you wish, look at uh, this issue of strategic financing and the importance of moving uh, from what has been a more inward funding approach to this. Uh, and on a fortnightly basis, we will get into a deep dive on very specific aspects uh, of, uh, of these issues. So session two will look at understanding uh, and picking up financial flows that go in and out of uh, countries. 
um, and that's public, private, uh, national and international um, uh, financing. And how do we then uh, tap into this much larger uh, world that is a very fast moving one? We will also in that session introduce a, a tool which is the development finance assessment tool. It's one amongst many, but it's one that has already been rolled out in um, over a dozen countries in both Asia and Africa. And we will hear uh, from our, some of our colleagues who have used this and benefited from it. Then session three, we'll take a closer look uh, at uh, and a very hands-on look at the impact of the results, early results, of those who actually have moved uh, this idea of leverage. Where has it worked? Uh, some global examples and some uh, country-based uh, examples of how some of these partnerships were established and what they resulted in. Then we have session four that will do a, a specific look at different financing instruments. As you know, for too long, um, most of the UN has been very stuck um, on uh, very particular tools, either assessed contributions uh, or voluntary contributions, um, and, and a, a few have managed to kind of push the, the boundaries uh, and in between, uh, but really um, we've, we've been very limited in the, the financial instruments that we uh, engage in. So this is uh, this session for we'll look at um, um, different entities, uh, UN, uh, who have tried their hand at other uh, instruments and see if and what is needed uh, to move in this direction and also the advantage uh, of moving with joint financing uh, instruments um, at, uh, at country. And the final session closes the loop and brings us then in this broader world how we optimize our own uh, resource mobilization uh, for, the, for the UN in order to deliver uh, on, uh, on all of this. And we will hear from uh, some of the most successful joint resource mobilization strategies uh, from, uh, from different parts of the world but also some global uh, examples and where we're seeing some of the innovations happening uh, in this, uh, in uh, with some of our teams. So let me stop there and now I'll hand over to Yannick, who has really been spearheading uh, this effort and this shift. I would say it's a huge cultural and mind shift uh, first, and uh, he's um, he's been uh, helping us do this for the whole uh, UNDG. Uh, Yannick, over to you. The, uh, thank you very much, uh, Kenny. Uh, greeting colleagues throughout the, uh, the world. The, at the onset, I would like to deeply uh, thank uh, the Staff College and the uh, UN DOCO for uh, organizing this very timely uh, series of webinars. And so, first, the key question is why should we bother about this idea of uh, fund shifting from funding to financing? What's new that will require us to go through such a paradigm shift? The key reason is that we are not on track to achieve the SDGs by 2030. The, uh, based on current trends, we will certainly have to wait for the second half of the 22nd century before uh, we achieve some of the SDGs uh, targets. And so, uh, on, a, on a business as usual uh, basis, we should certainly rename the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development the 2300 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Unfortunately, we have only uh, one planet, and I don't think the planet will be able to wait until 2300. And so uh, we need to break trends. And we know with the experience of the Millennium Development Goals that it's possible to break trends. Trends are not a, facility, uh, a fatality. And one of the most powerful instruments that we have to break trends is finance. It's aligning finance with our specific uh, goals. Finance basically is what decides what will be prioritized, what will be deprioritized, what will happen, what will not happen. And so one of the key 
uh, objectives in order to break trends and achieve the 2030 development agenda should be to align finance with sustainable development. I'm not aware about a single country in the world that can pretend that finance is aligned with sustainable development. The specifics will vary from one country to another one, but in every single country we have a severe misalignment. And if you look at uh, most developing countries, some of these uh, severe uh, misalignments include, for example, a dwarf of, a dearth of money for long-term uh, infrastructure. Most of the investment basically only go for uh, projects of two to three years, and you simply do not have enough money for long-term infrastructure, be port infrastructure, road or uh, hospital. The uh, because long-term investment are deemed as uh, too risky. Another major misalignment is financing of small and medium enterprises. It's next to impossible for small and medium enterprises to be financed in, uh, at uh, long-term affordable rates in developing countries. The gap is more than $250 billion, and we know that uh, SMEs are key in order to create decent jobs. Another major misalignment that we have is lack of financial inclusions. We have uh, basically close to 2 billion people that are not properly uh, included in financial systems. Another misalignment is lack of money for a critical social investment, such as, for example, education. We have the largest cohort of youth in history. And whether or not this largest cohort of youth will prove to be the largest development dividend in history or the largest development challenge in history will depend on whether or not we can educate them properly. And right now we are failing about 50% of uh, that largest cohort. The, if they are either not at school or if they are at school, they learn very little because of low quality of education. And uh, you know that one, for example, of uh, the SDG uh, is about education, SDG 4, one of the target, the target 4.1 is uh, universal access to uh, primary and secondary education, universal equitable quality uh, access to universal uh, uh, primary and secondary education. And the uh, young woman believes that this will take at least 95 years before we can achieve uh, this objective, the objective of universal access to, to upper secondary education for girls who are unfortunate enough to, to be born in families that are part of the bottom 20% in terms of uh, revenue. And so the, uh, we are not to achieve the SDGs based on our current trajectory one of the main reasons why we are not to achieve the SDGs is because finance is not aligned with sustainable development. And uh, if we do not fix this issue, everything else we'll do is basically tinkering at the margin. The, uh, and so um, the, uh, the challenge, aligning it in order to redirect at least $5 trillion a year for sustainable development. Kenny has mentioned that right now ODA is 48 uh, billion, so basically it's at the utmost is 1% of uh, the solution. When you are 1% of the solution, either you become very, very smart or you are totally irrelevant. And shifting from funding to financing, it's basically trying to remain relevant as a system by using our limited resources in a very smart, catalytic manner. And so we would like to become smart development entrepreneurs in order to break trends. And that's a bit the spirit of uh, the financing section of uh, the new uh, UNDAF uh, guidelines. Basically, what we recommend is uh, to start the entire exercise by trying to come up with uh, uh, a pretty good picture of all the financial flows as part of the preparation of the common country assessment. And uh, there are at least four main reasons why we believe that we have to start by trying to figure out what is the overall financing landscape in a given country. The first reason is for us to be a smart investors, to allocate our money strategically. The last thing we want is to basically duplicate uh, something that somebody else is doing or could do 
uh, for us. When you are very, very small and when you have some much larger financial flows, you have to try to figure out where these much larger financial flows are and what are the crying gaps that nobody is likely to address and that will require your, uh, your, your help. And so basically being a smart investor, simply identifying the key pressure point, taking into account what somebody else could finance or is already uh, financing. That's the first thing. The second thing is, that is uh, accessing additional resources. When you are small, you partner and you try to basically uh, blend your resources with the resources of other people. And uh, there are plenty of new type of resources. And for example, one of the growing uh, sources of finance for development is social impact investment. People who are basically uh, willing to accept an internal rate of return of uh, three or four percent. For those who are familiar with investment appraisals, some of the projects, some of the initial investment that we would like to see are not uh, profitable uh, financially at the market rate. They are profitable economically, but not financially. They are not profitable at 18 percent, at 25 percent, 30 percent. They have an economic return of much more than 30 percent, but they have a financial return of 5 percent, 10 percent. It's the usual disconnect between financial profitability and economic profitability. With social impact investors, we basically are saying, I'm looking for multiple development dividends. I'm looking for a decent return that offsets the inflation, 3, 4 percent. But if you give me the rest in social dividends, I'm fine. So meet my inflation needs, give me high quality social dividends. And so social impact investors, when they, when they, ac when they accept to basically go for three or 5% of, uh, of, uh, uh, of return in investment, it means it's a totally new world of investment that we can promote. We can also increasingly blend our resources with capital assistance. The, uh, so there are huge opportunities. Once you understand your ecosystem, your financial ecosystem, there are also not only huge opportunity in terms of being smart in what you finance, but huge opportunity in terms of partnering, in terms of uh, blending your resources, sequencing your resources, increasing your resources through basically uh, building coalition. So the second reason I would say is access. The first one is allocation, the second one is access. The third reason has been mentioned uh, by Kenny, it's leveraging. Even if we are very smart in the way we allocate our resources, even if we multiply by five or ten these resources because we have been able to build coalition for transformative change, financial coalition for transformative change, we still are not there, we still are not at five trillion dollars. And therefore it will be important to use this money in a highly catalytic manner to basically influence much larger financial flows. For example, how can you influence uh, much larger financial flows when you are in the, in the UN? If you are, if for those who have worked in a private company, the concept of leveraging ratio is very simple. It's your debt equity ratio. When it comes to the public sector, where your bottom, your bottom line is basically a development impact, your leveraging ratio will very much depend on your business model. For World Bank and the multilateral development banks that are in the business of credit enhancement instruments, partial loan guarantees, etc., the leveraging ratio is basically very uh, mechanical. It's uh, how much money they put compared to how much money the credit enhancement instruments can leverage. In the UN, our leveraging ratio is how much money we can influence by changing the policy environment. We know that one of the objectives of the SDGs, for example, is to change the energy matrix of the world from high carbon energy sources to low carbon energy sources. And we know that today low carbon energy sources, such as renewable energy technologies, are highly competitive if you put in place an enabling environment. And this enabling environment, what can it be? It can be, for example, phasing out fossil fuel subsidies so that so you have a fair competition field. <coughs> it can be streamlining the licensing process so that uh, in my country, for example, you had to have the authorization of 27 agencies to sit your uh, wind farm. 
this was not the result of bureaucratic uh, incompetence. It was the result of vested interest groups. And so uh, one of the major uh, policy change was to move from 27 agencies having to grant a license to only one. And it was the beginning of a dramatic increase in, uh, in, uh, in investment. It can be also local supply of uh, skills, making sure that you do not have to fly somebody from the other part of the world. And so basically, the UN mostly operates, when it comes to leveraging, through transforming markets, through transforming the set of incentives that affect the risk-reward profile of investment. UN, the UN has a track record of a being able to use one dollar to leverage ten thousand dollars, and uh, the only problem is that the UN does not know it, and that's uh, one of the things we will try. One of the knowledge gaps we would like to uh, to address. It's simply for the UN to know what the UN is doing and has been doing and should continue to do. So the third one is leveraging, leveraging with what you, the UN is about when it comes to leveraging policy. Uh, leveraging. And the fourth one and uh, is uh, basically what I would call incentives. Money is not neutral. Money is either a unifier or a divider. If you do not speak about money, you are very likely that it will be a divider. And uh, the, 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 right now, most of the financing instruments of the UN basically provide incentives for us for us to backstab each other in the back at the first opportunity. The, and you know, a big part of uh, the incentives that gets you promoted is whether or not you can mobilize uh, additional resources for your agency. Doesn't matter if, if it's at the expense of the entire system. Doesn't matter if I cost $10 to the United Nations Development System as long as I bring $1 to my agency. And that sh should not be acceptable. And the only way to make sure that we address this issue is through creating a minimum understanding within the UN system about what are the opportunities, what are the key priorities, what are the instrument, what are the partnership options, what are the instruments we could use, what are the incentives for cooperation or, 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 or lack of cooperation embedded in the instruments, and how do we align finance to delivering as one. How do we use money as a unifier? And uh, so in a sense, that's four of the key objectives. We, have not, we are not the only one, but I'll stop here because I see that I've used, almost used half, uh, uh, half of my time. But basically, when people tell me, is it really a priority? I would say, no, as long as you do not care about achieving the 2030 development agenda, as long as you do not care about uh, being uh, uh, relevant, as long as you do not care about being a smart uh, investors, as long as you do not care about uh, being uh, about delivering as one. If you don't, do not care about any of these issues, it's not a priority. If you do care about uh, basically remaining relevant, and you should at least uh, for plenty of personal reasons. This has to become a major uh, priority. And so normally, whenever I make this kind of uh, presentation, but that it, it's, I, it's seldom that somebody says, oh, actually, I don't care about uh, the 2030 agenda. I don't care about remaining irrelevant. I don't care about not uh, backstabbing my colleagues. The, uh, the, what I often hear is that, so how can we do it? We cannot already get funded uh, at scale. We have already too much work, and now you are bringing us an additional task. You are telling us that so we have to look at the overall pictures. What kind of support are you to give us? What kind of help? The, uh, do we have the capacity to do it? And, um, and it's a very, very valid point. And that has been, I will say, that uh, when we were working on the uh, uh, new uh, UNDAV guidance, the, we spent very, very little time on the why, why we should do it. There was a total, total agreement among, uh, among uh, all the members of uh, the working group. The bulk of the discussion was on the how. How can we do it? And how much of it should be compulsory? How much of it should remain uh, optional? How long will it take us to come up to speed? 
And so what we decided with uh, the uh, with uh, for, with the UNDAP was first not to make it mandatory to explain what should success should look five years down the line, 12, 15 years down the line, 15 years down the line, and our hope is that we will have a number of Pathfinder UN country team that will start immediately because they have the capacity, they will establish a knowledge base that other will be able to adopt at a later stage, etc. And we really hope that by 2025, I would say, everybody will be uh, will be up, to, up to, to speed. And so, what we are, in the guide, UNDAP guidance, we are basically saying that's what's normally shifting from funding to financing should be about. The, that's the minimal uh, element uh, you, uh, you should have and uh, try to move in that direction at your, uh, at your own speed. The, uh, one of the key things is basically trying to understand the overall financial picture. We do not start from scratch and we, don't, we do not have to start from scratch. Uh, for example, uh, the OECD is working on a new concept of TOS, Total uh, Official uh, Support for Sustainable Development. So maybe we can leverage the work we have been doing. Uh, World Bank, Multilateral Development Bank often work on it. UNDP has been working recently on the development finance assessment as part of the process of helping countries to develop the uh, national financing plan, integrated national financing plan. So I will expect that so, uh, in the future, when we start working on it with the CCA, we will already have some information. And so rather than having to spend countless hours about collecting this information, a lot we'll have to do with uh, basically uh, analyzing this information. On our side, what we are committing to is to basically try to codify the experience and make it uh, available to everybody. For a start with the Sundar guidance, there is this uh, webinar series and there is also a companion manual on the shifting from funding to financing. Let me stop here. Thank you very much, Yannick, and thank you, Connie, uh, for this very illuminating introduction into uh, funding to financing. Um, um, before, uh, actually, I'm going to hand the floor to Richard, who will lead our uh, question and answer segment of this webinar. Uh, and then, meanwhile, I will also be putting a few polls to all of you online, asking you uh, three questions. Uh, so without further ado, let me hand the floor for our question and answer session to, to Richard. Please, okay. Richard. Thanks, Peter. Um, thanks, uh, Yannick and Karin as well. Um, colleagues, thanks so much for sending in your questions. Um, but uh, if you haven't sent in a question yet, please do. Um, we'd be delighted to, uh, to receive them, and I'd be delighted to hand the difficult questions over to my colleagues to, uh, to answer them. Um, so we have a few. Um, and. Uh, I'll start with those. Um, there's a question here from my good friend Ned, um, who says, uh, great introduction. Um, the question being, what does this mean for the UN? Is it a new strategy or a new innovation or an existing business model? We need to develop new internal capabilities uh, We're different in each case. I would argue it's primarily a change of the business model and a big one requiring major internal change. Um, so that's the view from Ned. Um, Kenny, over to you to, uh, to start with the response, if that's okay. Ned, I couldn't agree with you more. I don't think uh, we are set up currently to, to really take on uh, this challenge. But here's the thing. We've been given a, a space now uh, to get on with it. Um, we actually put more limits on ourselves uh, than our legislation does. So it's less about, I would say, the rules and, and procedures and more um, to, to what Yannick uh, called the incentives. Um, you are not currently uh, rewarded uh, for uh, the, the four points that, that he made. This is not part of our markers of, of success. Um, however, we are seeing a, a shift uh, with, the, with the leadership and, and particularly with the new leadership um, of, the, of the SG really moving in this direction. I think also the writing is so much uh, on the wall. We're not going to be 
seeing a great flush of, of uh, traditional uh, development assistance um, uh, coming in. In fact, uh, you've heard some of the political leadership, uh, including in our host country here, uh, speak to this. So I think it's um, the, the, the leadership voice um, with the new wave coming through uh, now is going to be significantly different. Um, I think our fundamentals are sound. Uh, we, yes, I would say we have to build up our capabilities. We, we used to have a significant cadre of colleagues who were well versed in these areas. Uh, that was, I would say, um, went out the window about 20 years ago. Uh, so it's building up that skills and capabilities and, and then putting the incentives in place to make it happen. And through this webinar series, we will introduce to you where this has happened, but also where uh, new instruments have been used. Over to you, Anik. I, I can only uh, uh, echo your points, uh, Kenny. The, uh, the political economy, this first uh, webinar is very much on the uh, political economy. The political economy is extremely favorable to this, uh, to this paradigm shift because uh, you are 100% you are correct, it's a paradigm shift. It's uh, moving from being the doer to the facilitator, from uh, getting fi uh, funding for one project to fund one in, uh, uh, partner to basically structuring the entire uh, financing uh, architecture. So it's a major paradigm, sh paradigm shift. But the political economy is very favorable. The, as you know, the new Secretary uh, General uh, the, uh, wants to break silos across uh, across uh, humanitarian, peace and security, human rights, development, global concerns such as pandemics and climate, and there is no way we can break silos unless we address this issue of uh, aligning different type of finance, aligning uh, incentives. The new Secretary General also wants to make sure that the UN remain the dominant player in uh, development, remain relevant. And so, not surprisingly, among his first uh, decisions was the one to, to commission two, uh, two studies. Uh, uh, that one will be about uh, basically how can we finance the 2030 development agenda at scale and what should be uh, the role of uh, the United Nations system in supporting uh, such a leveraging, such a realigning of, uh, of uh, finance with sustainable development. So the big picture. How do, we, how do we align finance with sustainable development and what should be our role? And a second paper, which is how do we ensure that the United Nations system is both fit and funded for purpose? And so how do we, for example, can address this issue of uh, the increased uh, importance of, of non-core versus core, about the skills that we will need in order to be able to capitalize on the innovative financing instruments such as social impact uh, investment, etc. So it's, uh, we have right now a very powerful uh, uh, political uh, economy uh, in favor of uh, such a paradigm shift. In terms of resources, I don't think we need additional resources. We need a better use of existing resources to be able to do it. The, uh, we have plenty of different platforms. We have plenty of different platforms when it comes on innovative, about innovative financing mechanism, leveraging, etc. And so maybe rather than having uh, a large number of different platforms, a large number of uh, short lived working groups, panels, etc., if we were to basically to establish a uh, permanent structure and consolidate everything, my, my gut feeling is that so by consolidating all the different resources that we have fragmented in different uh, initiatives, we could reach a critical mass to provide the colleagues from the UN country team with the type of backstopping they will need to, uh, to take the lead on this issue. Excellent. Uh, Amy and Yannick, thanks so much. Um, the only, your only challenge was that you answered one question and ten more arrived. <laughs> while, while you were talking, um, and they're arriving, as you said, so yeah. Well, let's try to get through them as quickly as we can, but while we're doing that also, we're just going to launch our first poll question. Um, so Peter's about to launch that, so somehow that should appear somewhere, and hopefully you'll be able to answer that. Um, but quickly, oh, here it comes. Um, I just moved that. 
So uh, quickly on to the questions, and thanks so much for them. Um, the first one, um, so uh, Moshan asked if whether we could um, uh, summarize the, the, the points in terms of a PowerPoint or, or um, uh, just bullet points, we'll definitely do that and get that to you for sure. Um, Envesa is inspired, so thank you very much to uh, Kani and Yanni for that. That's really appreciated, and she has a question as well. Um, the financial needs of the country national financing plan, what would be the first step in terms of how to go about this and whom to involve to spearhead the process? Partnerships, World Bank, UN, um, in some parts of, uh, of some of the different countries you work, maybe the EU. So that's a, a question to you both. How, how do you get this actually started? How do you move this? I would, uh, I just have one sentence on this. Um, I would say our starting point is not uh, the international players, it's, the Ministry, it's the Ministry of Finance and it's the Minister of Finance. In the countries we're seeing the, the UN teams doing really well, it's getting back a relationship uh, that in some places is doing very well, in some places has been weakened or lost uh, with your central entities, one the Ministry of Finance and second your Treasury Secretary. The, uh, here again, I can only echo what Kenny said. Your entry point should be the Minister of Finance, not even the Ministry yeah. of Finance. The person in the government that has, that has an interest which is 100% aligned to shifting from funding to financing is the Minister of Finance. The Minister of Finance has exactly the same needs, trying to figure out what are the existing financial flows, how she or he can basically promote the sustainable development of her or his country through being a smart investors, through uh, sequencing different types of, of, of funds, through leveraging as much resources as possible, through getting her or his ministries to basically cooperate, property cost, etc. So with the MDGs, we have seen a bit of a deprioritization of planning and financing. With the SDGs, we will have to see a reprioritization of planning and financing. Thank you. One last one and I'll go. Okay. Um, it's not clear. Um, this is a question from UNDP Iran. Um, it's not clear in the introduction whether we want all the dollars coming to the UN system being spent through the UN or it means we should affect current national budgets, government or private sector in a way being used for the FDG government. The, uh, when you speak about leveraging, you are definitely not speaking about money that will come through the UN. Your success criteria is not how much money you get, it's how much money you influence. And so this means that we will have to have a different way of uh, measuring success. Where it's not only the amount of resources that we directly channel, but the largest amount of financial flows that uh, we uh, influence. And uh, in the funding to financing, we will provide some uh, pointers on the on leveraging ratio. No, is it, does it mean that we will be altruistic and look after everybody but ourselves? The, you know, it's uh, the, the saying of Goldman Sachs, short term, uh, short term altruistic, long term greedy. The, uh, when it comes to finance, it's often the case. The, you have to be short term altruistic if you want to be long term greedy. The financiers that have forgotten that mm. basically uh, uh, paid a heavy, heavy price. By by basically being a smart investor, by creating coalition for change, by leveraging much larger financial flow, we will increase our value proposition and therefore ultimately we will we should be able to significantly increase the amount of money that will be channeled uh, through our books. So by focusing on the overall financial flows, we will also increase our financial flow. Great. Okay. Next question from Pakistan, Sawa. Um, hi. Um, it will be slightly easier for infrastructure projects to show the return on investment to the private sector, but will the private sector have any appetite for the softer work that we do? How can we pitch it? But first, there are areas. The private sector. When you speak about trillion, you speak about the capital. You speak about capital markets, huh? and therefore you speak about the private sector. The uh, the, you do not want to. You you do the reason why you want to basically structure different financial flows is because first the private sector is not a monolith. 
And so you want to work with some type of private sector in some areas, some type of private sectors in other areas. And in other areas, public money should be your first uh, call of duty. For example, one of the advantage of making sure that public money does not finance infrastructure that can be financed by the private sector is to ensure that maybe you can keep your public money for education. We know that the idea of uh, basically charging fees for education is a major uh, barrier for the poor. And so when you think in terms of structuring finance, you try to figure out, okay, what can be financed by the private sector with positive incentives? So, for example, I move out of uh, I move out of this infrastructure because there the private sector can do it, and therefore I can save this money so that I can reduce uh, the uh, financial barriers to education for the poorest. So, it's uh, the private sector is not a monolith. You have to understand what are the different type of private sectors, and the private sector has to be embedded within a broader uh, integrated national financing uh, strategy for the SDGs. Great. Yanni, thanks. Um, Henriette's just uh, stepped up as well, who's the Deputy Director of the Marty Partner Trust Fund Office and also the Chair of the Joint Funding Task Team, which is uh, uh, an interagency group which does a lot of good work trying to move these different types of uh, issues forwards. Um, thanks again for your questions which keep coming in, which is great, and we've still got quite a few more. Um, so I uh, will move on to a question from Gonzalo now, so to, uh, to Yannick and Henriette. Um, so great insights. Uh, thanks, Gonzalo. Um, how could we help the favorable political economy to this paradigm shift at country level, where inertia sometimes is a big obstacle? Here again, uh, if we had had this webinar, in uh, two or three years ago, the likelihood of success will have been extremely low. The, uh, the fact that uh, the SDGs were approved for the first time, humankind has a common uh, plan for, uh, for prosperity, people, and the planet. The fact that everybody realized that this will, this will basically require much larger financial flow. The fact that so, the Addis Ababa uh, agenda uh, for action uh, recommend the preparation of an integrated national financing plan give us uh, a forum for a policy dialogue that we would not have had two or three years ago. So a possibility could be for, uh, for, uh, for the UN country team as part of the preparation of the new CCA and the UNDAP to reach out to the Ministry of uh, Finance and as I mentioned earlier maybe to the Minister and Finance and say where, uh, where do you stand regarding the preparation of the integrated national financing uh, uh, plan? Can we help? Mm -hmm. And uh, if uh, and what kind of addition, what kind of specific inputs uh, uh, could we prepare? And uh, once you have a plan, after you can also discuss about how you can help in implementing the plan. Great. Thanks. Okay, moving on. Next question. Tracy, thanks for this question. Um, with the pace of UN of reform within the UN have been being slow in some areas, how does a paradigm shift for the UNDS uh, to be a smart development entrepreneur take place in a timely fashion? Great question. Before it's too late, um, what are or will be the key underpinnings? The uh, either we deliver as one or we will make ourselves irrelevant as one. And uh, the, uh, we are not having this webinar because we like it. It's a matter of uh, uh, survival for the United Nations system. The, uh, we have just gone through the ECOSOC dialogue. And uh, in a sense, everybody knows that the only way we can implement the SDGs is through integrated policy change. And so how do you promote integrated policy change in the UN? There are two options. One is through consolidation, where you basically move from 47 agencies to 10. Or the other one is through coordination, where you basically leverage the diversity of uh, your United Nations development uh, agencies so that you can bring different types of expertise to bear to meet the unique requirement of each country. Almost all member states are uh, in agreement that diversity is the strength of the United Nations system. but the, uh, the big questions that have been asking us is what will you be doing in the next 15 years that you haven't done in the past 15 years in order to deliver as one? And uh, 
the one of uh, one of the element of response of the UN is basically to try to come with one strategic plan and the uh, and one strategic plan that basically align action and that's the reason why this new UNDAF uh, guidance uh, is uh, are so critical is because we are trying through the CCA to come up with a common visions for uh, everybody and uh, that's uh, humanitarian development, peace and security that immediately translate into action at the country level. Great. Henry. Let me just add one thing uh, for my side, for each individual staff member as well. A paradigm shift doesn't just happen at headquarters or somewhere else. It has to happen in your own head. <coughs> Every staff member has to start behaving differently because our incentives are not yet completely aligned behind this new agenda. So it's for us also to say, can we speak up when we see opportunities to bring a UN country team together, for instance, to talk with the Ministry of Finance, or do we each of our agencies go individually and go back into that old paradigmship? So if we want to change, it's also asking these questions, each of us, where we are, are we ready to change ourselves today, to uh, next month? In the coming years. Thanks, Henry. Great. Um, we've got so so about five minutes more question and answer. Then we're going to hand over to Ida to kind of wrap up and, and summarise things. We've still got quite a few more questions um, to go through. Thanks. They're great questions. So um, David here has a question. Uh, a shift from finance funding fu uh, funding to financing is definitely the right direction. However, this shift must be parallel with a shift away from technical implementation to a more oh, Hang on. That was Sorry, oh. David. My, um, your questions just disappeared. Um, so uh, it was a good question. Just give us uh, a second and we'll find it again. Sorry. Bear with us. Um, and it's nearly there. Okay, great. David, apologies. So. Um, a shift from funding to financing is definitely in the right direction. However, this shift must be parallel with a shift away from primary, primarily technical implementation to a more balanced set of skills, particularly in policy and, by, and advisory support. How do we help the smaller agencies to manage this shift, given their significant support on project income to be resident in a country? Maybe you are a UN women, uh, well placed. The uh, first, uh, the uh, you don't have uh, you don't have a dichotomy between policy and projects. Projects basically it's a it's a management vehicle to achieve something, and so my my recommendation would be that so uh, small agencies should shift from having uh, technical uh, projects toward policy driven projects. You are you are still to projectize your uh, your inputs your need in a project. But the objective of your projects would be policy change. It will not be, uh, for example, uh, developing the skill of uh, one minist ministry to uh, implement a geographic information system. So it's uh, the my my uh, my response would be that uh, increasingly the United Nations system will move toward policy-driven projects. Right. Thank you. Um, I think we've got time for a couple more questions. Um, this is from BJ. What is the panel view on this trend of social impact funds? How do you foresee us showing profits and returns to get investors interested in these funds? The, uh, for me, social impact investment fund is certainly one of the most promising developments that we have seen uh, over, uh, over the past decades. As I mentioned earlier, there are a lot of extremely worth wide projects from a societal viewpoint that uh, do not have uh, enough of a financial return to basically mobilize private resources. In a number of developing countries, the, uh, the cost of money is uh, between 15 to 30 percent. And so, for example, uh, any kind of uh, any kind of project such as uh, uh, investing in a dryer in order to reduce uh, post-harvest uh, losses in agriculture and strengthen food security, is food security increase the internal rate of, uh, increase uh, the revenues of farmers, they don't make it with uh, a cost of money of uh, 15 to 30 percent. 
despite that from a societal viewpoint, they are critical projects. Now, the social impact investors, in a sense, because they are saying that they want to have different uh, return on investment, part of the return financial, part in terms of social development dividends, there's projects that are uh, very interesting from a societal viewpoint that could not make it on the market rates, suddenly it becomes possible. So if you can get the money at a, at a 5 or 10 percent uh, interest rate, the a project which is extremely worthwhile but that would not have been financed by a bank get financed. And so a lot of these wonderful initiatives that were either to be financed for grant money, scarce grant money, are not being financed at all, nor can be financed by social impact investors. And it's one of these examples where uh, a lot of the our traditional projects can now be shifted to social impact investors and it's, it's enable us to re-prioritize uh, our grant resources toward, the, for example, policy change. We have also, one of the problems we have in finance is the concept of broken labor, where we have a little bit of money at this stage, we have potentially a lot of other money at a, at a, longer, a later stage, but nothing in the middle. And so now we can also start thinking in terms of uh, activities where we use grant money for the proof of concept. We use social impact investment to scale it up to the stage where it's become commercially viable, and at that stage we use normal uh, commercial finance. So it's a, it's, a, it's a new tool in our toolbox, and it's a tool that could basically uh, transform the entire way we, we do our financial engineering. Right now the UN is not geared to use that tool. And we have to make sure that we we, we gear up to, uh, to to this objective very quickly. Great, thank you. What I think um, we'll do, we'll take the last question, then we're going to hand over to Ida from the, the staff college. Um, there are a few other questions, and we'll commit and we'll we'll answer these questions offline, and, and we'll circulate them as part of the, the feedback that we give. Um, but the last question, I think, from Milos uh, in Montenegro, is a is a good kind of summary question. Um, he asks, what does funding to finance actually mean at its core? At this core, it means being smart in order to remain relevant. Excellent. Okay. Thank you, Yannick. Thank you, Henriette. So, Peter, we, we can shift across because Haida over in Bonn. Um, so, we, we're doing this workshop. It's a partnership between DOCO and the uh, United Nations Systems Staff College, which we're really pleased about. Uh, and so Ida from the Staff College is going to just kind of wrap up the, the seminar and explain to us what's next. So we just need to switch the, the kind of the microphone from New York to Bonn, um, which Peter's hopefully doing now, uh, and then we'll hand over to her. Um, is that working, Peter? Ida, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Very well. Cool. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone um, connecting to us from different parts of the world. It's really exciting to be collaborating with you and Doko on this um, series. So we're happy really uh, about partnering. Um, I represent the UNSCC Knowledge Center for Sustainable Development in Bonn. And what I will do for the next five minutes is to wrap up the conversation um, the exciting um, you know, exchange that we've had uh, with the panelists uh, and um, the ex excellent questions that were received from um, the many participants who connected to us today. I will also um, walk you through for the, to the next webinar that we will have and then um, uh, provide you some uh, pointers in terms of um, connecting to the recording uh, once um, um, the, the seminar is over today. So what we have heard today with Connie um, bringing us on board on why, um, why uh, we started um, to think about you know, um, the funding to financing, um, how it is a, a critical turning point at this point in time with an ambitious agenda, um, with the financial landscape shift and um, the costing that is required. Uh, for achieving Agenda 2030, which is calculated not in billions but in trillions uh, for now. So what, um, what we have um, decided to uh, launch with the with webinars, uh, with the five webinars, is basically to kick it off 
the conversation around what, why, and how uh, about the, the, the funding to financing. Today's webinar uh, was sort of a teaser and um, a generic overview of um, what it is and uh, why is it important. Um, the next four um, webinars will be um, broadcast um, in uh, two weeks, um, uh, once in two weeks, um, every time on Tuesday at 8.30 Eastern Standard Time. And uh, we will provide the link uh, through which you can connect and uh, distribute to your um, interested colleagues. So just quickly, um, the, the, the second webinar will be concentrating uh, around understanding the financial flows in a country. Um, the third one will be looking uh, really and taking a deep dive into the idea of leveraging. And um, the fourth one uh, would be um, talking about the variety of UN financing instruments and tools that are available, um, the, bene the benefits of um, the UN instruments and pooled funding. And the fifth and final webinar will be actually talking about the resource mobilization for the UN. <laughs> Um, then we had an intervention from Yanni, who actually um, got us really, um, really deep into why is it important to um, to talk about uh, this paradigm shift, which is not necessarily something that is happening at the HQ, but rather than is to be happening in the heads and at the country level, at the regional level. So this is uh, something that is a paramount uh, prerequisite for achieving Agenda 2030. He has walked us through some of the critical areas where we are risking not achieving the SDGs and we need um, a, a SAP to break the trends to be on track. Um, we also um, should recognize um, that the importance of actually um, shifting um, to finance lies in the way we have been operating so far. The business as usual of um, transferring money from a financial contributor to a recipient is not any more relevant and is not helping um, indeed um, achieving the Agenda 2030. What needs to happen is basically understanding the financial flows, understanding it's on the country level, seeing uh, UN um, amongst the different players, um, putting a lot of emphasis on the political economy um, that is the, the campus of where the, the shift should happen, talking um, to, to the people, to the entities that are um, in the decision-making drive as the ministers of finance to make sure that we as the UN play a catalytic role in the implementation of the Agenda 2030 whereas we are actually leveraging the limited resources that we have to make the best impact we can and um, structure the different sources of public, private and innovative financing. Um, he also reminded us that there are actually four main reasons um, to do that. First would be to be a smart investor. The second is about um, the access, accessing additional resources um, and that means blending, sequencing, partnering and increasing our own resources, leveraging, which is not necessarily leveraging the money, but rather than influencing the money. Uh, and he brought us the example of uh, shifting to low carbon energy resources and what it takes. It's a lot about the policy um, leveraging and about enabling the environment, which is actually one of the key uh, roles that you're in place. Um, and we should uh, capitalize on that. And the fourth reason is basically creating incentives and playing that because money can be either a unifier or a divider and what we really want to do is um, the money to play uh, the unifier role and um, that will increase us as the UN delivering as one um, and using the right um, options and partnerships to make, to make the shift. Um, we had um, a couple of uh, interesting questions from the field from different agencies and uh, representations one key point um, that uh, came out of that conversation is now with the new um, Secretary General, we see um, political will and leadership voice that goes in the direction of making the shift a reality. Um, there are um, two studies that have been uh, commissioned by the Secretary General that will help us understand how 
can the financing play the role that it needs to play to achieve the agenda 2030? What is the role of the UN development system and how we as UN can um, work to be fit for purpose? Um, what came also out of, of the exchange is uh, that our starting point, and I repeat here at this point, that um, should be the, the actual, the national, the national authorities that play the role in, in making the resources available, um, partnering, and that would be the ministries of finance and a number of um, national players and not the international players. So for us as the UN, that should be the starting point. Um, the role of private sector has been really emphasized and um, actual understanding uh, what are the different uh, private sectors available and how we can work with that as the UN. Um, um, Jani also shared with us um, the, the recent conversations in ECOSOC dialogue um, and what is definitely coming out of it is that diversity is one of the strengths of the UN development system and what it takes for us um, to make our act together for the next 15 years and um, be um, speaking in one voice, having one strategy. And that's why the new UNDAP guidance um, that is shortly coming out is very important. And funding to companion <coughs> piece will be part of the UNDAP guidance where at um, the um, CCA and the UNDAP and the strategic planning will definitely need to look into how we do this um, um, shift uh, from funding to financing. And um, one last point is that we still need to um, look at um, the partners that are doing already um, improvements in, in the area of that shift and obviously we're not starting from scratch so there are things going on with the World Bank and UNDP so what um, the UNDG and DOCO will be helping um, um, a field, uh, to the field colleagues is basically understanding um, and seeing the different experiences that are out there. So that will be coming out uh, shortly as well. Um, just with the, with the last point to kind of uh, move us ahead um, to the next point um, of uh, announcing the next webinar is basically what I also took out of the first webinar is that UN needs to change uh, from funding model to a financing model because we cannot do without it if we want and where if we are serious about achieving Agenda 2030. So that it's not a matter of um, discussing um, why and whether, but it's, it's actually one of the paramount things that we need to do. And the focus is basically on structuring different financial flows to achieve a common result. So that's the takeaway from me uh, out of this webinar. Um, to remind everyone that the second uh, webinar that will be broadcast on the 14th of February, Tuesday at 8.30 Eastern Standard Time, we'll talk about um, calculating the full financing flows in the countries. Uh, we will have our regional um, colleagues, advisors, and country office colleagues sharing their experience with the tool development and finance assessment, which was piloted in 16 countries of the Asian, the Pacific, and African regions. And it will talk about actually understanding the different financing flows in the country, um, including public, private, national, international. So please stay tuned. Um, join us on the 14th of February um, through the link that was shared through the CPN and Yammer One UN um, Knowledge Exchange Conversation uh, Group. We will uh, circulate the link to the next webinar uh, in case you haven't had the chance to sign up for the next one. And um, the last announcement from my side is, um, as you have heard Peter say, we have been recording today's webinar in case you want to go back and really drill down to some of the key messages that have been discussed uh, today, uh, we will be posting uh, the recording on UN DOCO website and on the Peer Talk platform of the UN System Staff College. Um, and we will be circulating the link through CPN um, and uh, Yammer group uh, that I've just mentioned. With this, I would like to thank our distinguished uh, speakers, Jan Ekani and Yanni, for the uh, very insightful uh, presentations and sharing their experiences and developments that are coming through. Uh, we're looking, really looking forward um, 
to the next um, webinars where we will drill down um, deep into the um, topics and different aspects of um, funding to financing shift. Um, I also would like to announce that uh, with the message we will also share the answer to some of the questions that we couldn't answer today and we apologize for that. But um, on that I would like to thank everyone for joining us um, at different time zones. Uh, uh, we really appreciate your time and hope that these series of webinars will be indeed very useful to your duty stations and to the work ahead of us um, on this important path of achieving sustainable development at Agenda 2030. Thank you very much. I wish everyone a beautiful day. Over.